This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 520 of the Juice Box Podcast. Back in 2019, I was invited to speak at the Omnipod headquarters in Massachusetts. I gave a little talk to all of the employees about why what they do is so important to people like me and my daughter and everyone like you. While I was there, I was given a tour. I didn't just get to see the offices, but I saw the actual place, the production floor where Omnipods are made. And let me tell you, it is as futuristic and as amazing as you can imagine. Anyway, this tour was given to me by a man named Chuck, and by how unassuming he was, I had no idea of the important position that he held at Insulet. He's just very humble, and I found his sincerity and his excitement about the production to be infectious, and I've wanted to talk to him since then. But he's not the kind of guy who gives interviews, so it took me a little while. But I'm really excited for you to hear Chuck's story about how he got to Omnipod, how they designed the floor where the production happens, and and so much more. Please remember while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. Just one ad today, so I'm going to get it out of the way for you right now so we can listen to Chuck straight through. Gvoke Hypopen has no visible needle and is the first pre-mixed auto-injector of glucagon for very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes, ages 2 and above. Not only is Gvoke Hypopen simple to administer, but it's simple to learn more about. All you have to do is go to gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Gvoke shouldn't be used in patients with insulinoma or pheochromocytoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk. Just a second here before we get started, I need to tell you that Chuck's voice is incredibly deep. It is so deep that his recording equipment has trouble capturing the the richness and timber in his voice. If you put Chuck next to Sam Elliott and gave him lines from The Big Lebowski, you'd think to yourself, huh, Sam Elliott has a really high-pitched voice. Our potters and folks, so. And Scott, you got to get back to do another plant tour. Oh, well... All right, so we're recording now. So just I'll, I'll okay. introduce I'll introduce you, so you don't have to. <laughs> That'll be easy. I'll do that later. Um, just let me tell you that the minute I left the plant tour that I took, which now I think might have been a couple of years ago, it feels like uh, I thought I want to interview this person because I just wanted to f- I wanted to understand how you get to a position in your life where you're the right choice to design a manufacturing floor. So I know that sounds like maybe not what you expected, but Chuck, I want to know where you went to college and what you thought you were going to do with your life and what path you took. So that's a great question. Uh, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia. Uh, my family's still down in the Philadelphia area. I went to school down there. I actually started studying food science because I grew up in the restaurant industry and I thought that, uh, you know, that's what I was going to do. And growing up, I started thinking to myself, you know, you're working all the holidays and, you know, uh, is this really what I want to do with my life, the rest of my life? And so I changed majors. I actually moved over to business uh, with an emphasis on industrial engineering, organizational dynamics at the University of Pennsylvania, which Betsy had sent me to. So when I graduated, I had a brief stint with the Detroit Lions uh, that didn't last long with injuries, and then uh, got a job with PepsiCo. Okay, hold on. So you just you just skipped right over the fact that you sounds like you played for the Lions for a half a second. So did you play? Fo- <laughs> did you play? Did you play football at Penn? No, no, I did in my undergrad, Delaware Valley University. Oh, so okay, uh, yeah. So I did skip over it because it was such a long time ago, uh, and it was only a year. Right. Uh, But then I uh, hooked up with Pepsi in Philadelphia and started off as a third shift sanitation supervisor, which is critical in the plant, a food processing plant. 
mm-hmm. and then uh, moved around with PepsiCo, uh, different parts of the country, back to headquarters in New York. I ran their international operations. I ran their concentrate operations, which was a GM assignment. And then I moved to and ran North America operations. And I retired after uh, 30 years to the day, uh, one of the last corporations with the full pension and benefits, which was excellent. Yeah. So I uh, retired and I wanted to spend more time with family with all the travel that was required in my role as the head of operations, especially internationally. It was a prime time to spend with my family, especially my kids, um, who are so important to me and everything to me. So uh, I would wake up and make them breakfast, drive them to school, go play some golf, (laughs) pick them up at school. Uh, It was just a wonderful time of my life and the perfect time to be able to retire. Uh, But then I started getting calls for consulting. Uh, Pepsi folks are everywhere running businesses, and I was consulting, starting up operations and supply chains for a lot of companies uh, internationally and domestically. Some folks were asking me to come back full time, which I had said no. I was enjoying my uh, balanced life, as I called it. And then uh, I started consulting for Insulet. I got the call from Insulet, and that was a real easy one to say yes to full time. So I've been full time for five years now. Yeah. Um, the, I, I guess it might sound odd to some people, you know, Pepsi insulin pumps, but it's the process of, of setting up the floor and understanding materials and workflow, that kind of stuff is, I I would imagine, excuse me, I would imagine runs over top of anything you're manufacturing, right? It doesn't need to be food. It doesn't need to be a medical device. It's, it's, I, I mean, like, why would they... I know you said there's Pepsi people everywhere, but do you know how they found you? Do you know why they were looking for you? In select? Yeah. Yeah, so the chief human resource officer was ex-PepsiCo, so he knew me at Pepsi. Uh, He actually called home. I wasn't home. Uh, My wife had answered and said, uh, Brad, call and would like you to look this company up. And I'll be honest, I looked them up. This was December 2015. I looked them up online and I said, when he calls back, I'm not here. I'm not going to consult. There was not a lot of positive news on online back then in 2015 with product recalls and warning letters from the FDA. I saw mm-hmm. nothing positive from our potters. Uh, but then Brad called and I did answer. And uh, he said, no, come and meet the new team and see the product and all the potential we have. So because of my relationship with Brad, I did. I came up. I met Pat and Chasey their commitment to turn this place around, I said, yes, I would consult. And about six weeks into consulting, uh, they had started talking to me to do full-time. Uh, I commute from Connecticut every week, stay up here. Uh, I just love what we're doing. I love our mission. I love our team, uh, the potential, the trajectory for growth and changing people's lives, living with diabetes is why I'm still here five years later after retirement. Do you have any personal connection to type 1 or type 2 diabetes? I have family members, and when I traveled internationally, I have very, very good friends I still keep in touch with, especially when I travel overseas to visit my sites uh, who live with diabetes. My daughter's best friend, I got to see it firsthand. Uh, as growing up, she was our star athlete in school, uh, and I got to see what she had to go through. Uh, living with diabetes, what her parents as caregivers had to live through. And I just said, I want to change change that life. I want to change that life for that individual and then more individuals. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's it's personal why I'm here five years later and still doing what I'm doing and commuting from Connecticut. And not being a uh, a short order cook and a golf pro. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Uh, again, I that was fun while it lasted, but uh, you know, to your question on why Pepsi to hear it's and I always say to folks is PepsiCo taught you quality first. That was our focus in every single plant. I had, you know, dozens and dozens of plants reporting to me. When you're producing billions and billions of cans and bottles a year, you better get it right. As we say, you get a lot of folks sick very quickly. So, but believe it or not, because it's soda, as we say, the focus on quality was uh, job one. 
Yeah. And when I came here, I expected it to be the same. And because of the 2015 warning, it wasn't quite there. So I, I just wanted to bring that mindset here. Well, I think you definitely have. There's um, My daughter's been using the Omnipod since she was four, and she turned 17 the other day. And um, the company has clearly not just like turned a corner that would that wouldn't be giving it enough credit it's somebody inside said we're gonna do this differently and it just changed direction in my opinion i've always i mean if i'm being honest chuck prior i always thought it was a company set up to be sold and now it feels to me like a group of people who want to make insulin pumps that's exactly right and that's the biggest compliment that me personally and my team that we can get as I tell folks. And I did a call last week with with a potter, uh, was in the audience and said it's been three and a half years since they had a pot fail. That's the compliment yeah. that, uh, that we get. Yes, you saw our plant. We built a world-class manufacturing operation here, but the pride is the quality improvements that have come out of that plant and uh, our plants in China. So when you got there in 2015, what was, can you say what some of your first direction was? What what were your ideas? Uh, let's see. Uh, there was many of them. Uh, you know, it was interesting. We had single days of inventory. Uh, we didn't have very good relationships with suppliers. And to me, quality starts with every single component. Uh, we had dozens and dozens of components in our pod. We had to get those uh, more reliable, more consistent. So my number one priority first was to work with our suppliers to improve quality, consistency, and reliability. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we've we've been working that for five years and continue to work it. Uh, secondly, you saw the active manufacturing, as I said, is one of the first things I was very, very surprised. And to chasing the team's credit, I was surprised that, you know, a device that people's lives depend on to manage their diabetes was single sourced out of China. Uh, again, I ran international operation. I've been to China a hundred times plus. Uh, I knew the volatility. Uh, so as we built capacity to support our growth, it was also to build outside of China for risk mitigation, redundancy. Uh, and that's where Actin, that's where the idea of Actin came from. So that was our, you know, Supplier quality, redundancy, risk mitigation, and building capacity, and that's where Actin, our U.S. manufacturing facility, came from. So that's what I focused on first when I got here. Right. I have to admit, when I saw it, I didn't know what I was going to see. And there's this giant, you know, it, it's a clean room, right? It's it's yes. completely sealed. There's there's people working in there. There are robots moving things around. The machinery that's that's um, putting things together and producing things. It, it, it's, it looks like it's out of a movie. Like if I took a camera in there and did some close up shots and interspersed them in a Marvel film, you'd think I was making Tony Stark's <laughs> like costume. You know what I mean? Like it really is yeah. fascinating. And does that come like when you decide to do that, you just say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to stay here full time. You get, you're in charge of that project. Is that right? That's correct. Right. Do you then bring in a team or do, can you, how do you build the team that's going to, make this happen? We brought in a team of very, very experienced automation engineers, uh, upgraded the engineering department. Uh, I brought two other folks out of PepsiCo that used to run my operations out of retirement. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I say that because I think that says a lot about Insulet and our mission, that people come out of retirement to come and work here. Uh, But I knew I could depend on them to focus on quality first. They got the mindset it starts with every single component. So one of them moved to China to fix the operation over there and improve the operation, while the other one managed the day-to-day of building the active manufacturing, and he had built plants for me at PepsiCo. Uh, So it was bringing in the right mindset, uh, the right experience, and we wanted to build a world-class manufacturing facility. So to your point on robotics and automation, it's funny, folks have toured said it looks like a Transformer movie, so it's funny you said a Marvel movie. <laughs> it is, but of all the robots, what we're really proud of that you don't see, and you may have remembered I pointed out the, the blue flashing that was taking place at the different cells, as we call them, where we're building the sub-assemblies to be, eventually become a, a pod, is the quality 
the camera technology that we put in the, in the, each of the assemblies. There's 47 camera technologies that are measuring every single quality attribute that wasn't measured before. And, you know, a tenth of a second, we can decide pass or fail. Wow. And by doing that, you're almost guaranteed, if you will, a perfect pot at the end of the production. Does the, um, does the system learn? Does it teach itself? Well, it teaches us with the data collection. We're collecting so much data, as I said, over 2 billion quality metrics per year per line. We're gathering that data, then we take that data and we work back with our component suppliers uh, globally so then we can transfer those learnings to China uh, manufacturing, which are the same components. So they're teaching us. I don't know if I would say the robots are teaching or learning themselves, but uh, we can adjust our automation and robotics based off of those learnings. Yeah. So the more pods you make, the more data you have back the better Absolutely. decisions you can make in the future on things. Absolutely. What's the, um, how, what is the rate of rejection? Does, do you see a lot of parts? Yeah, I don't want to get into specifics. I will say in the beginning, much higher than I would have ever anticipated. Uh, again, but the, as I said from the beginning, working with our suppliers to get more reliable, more consistent, more quality. Uh, so we had a fairly high rejection rate from any manufacturing best practice standards, mm -hmm. but that has significantly, significantly reduced uh, the waste and scrap because, again, over the years, a couple of years, just with those learnings and all the data we've collected, we're able to go back with data to those suppliers and improve their systems and processes. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. So you, you have these better relationships and I guess that even makes it easier for you to walk back and say, hey guys, look, this is coming like this this is what we think will fix it. And then they work with you and get it together. Absolutely. And it's all data driven. It's, it's, wow. not, it's not emotions. It's not feelings. It's strictly the data coming off of that camera technology I talked about. It's amazing. You're making me for some reason, think about uh, automated driving like Tesla. Like they talk about all the time. They need more cars driving on the road to get into more situations so they can get more data and, 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 keep fine tuning it. It's really, really fascinating. It is powerful. Yeah. People always say it really is, especially on our pod when you, you're talking dozens and dozens of components and, you know, tens of millions of pods a year that we're producing that many we're gathering a lot of data. Absolutely. You got more than a couple of days worth of backlog made now. <laughs> <laughs> a couple months, maybe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so when, when COVID happened and, and things are starting to not move around the world as quickly, you had a you you had a couple of months to, but did it ever get in? Did you ever get into a place where you thought, "Ooh, this is close," or were you able to keep your your stuff flowing? No, um, I guess the camera technology, the quality improvements we're making with our components is what we're most proud of. But I would say the unexpected we talked about when we were building Acton to support our growth, but also for risk mitigation redundancy. Mm -hmm. It proved itself in the, you know, in the pandemic. Yeah. We did not skip a beat. As we continue to grow double digits, we did not miss one shipment to one of our customers. And we're very proud of that because a lot of, a lot of supply chains were going down, scaling back. Uh, people don't realize we have plants in China. I had lost production capacity in China when COVID hit there first, but I had Acton to continue to produce. And then when it came here, we got China back up and running. So we had both facilities running. We have lots of inventory. There was never a risk to our potters, which we're most proud of. And that was the benefit of building an act in and having a redundancy here yeah. closest to our largest customer. That's comforting. I mean, as a person who, you know, I watch my daughter put on a pot every three days. So uh, it's it's got so much to do with her health and her the ease that she lives that um, you had to think of it just going away is frightening. Yeah, no, it's we're not allowed to miss shipments to our potters as we always talk to our folks. And he, as you saw the tour, we have printed on the walls as every potter every time. And that, that just simply means that we are able to ship the pod every single time a customer expects it. And it works every single time as intended. Yeah, oh, that's excellent. So I have a question because I know people listening wonder all the time. Like, do you think the form factor of the pod will ever change? 
Well, we're always looking at improving the form factor. You know, we do hear from our customers. They would prefer a smaller pot. On the other hand, we also hear we would like a larger reservoir. So there's a lot of work on, you know, innovation, form factor improvements. Uh, do I think that someday? Yes. I mean, we are always going to look at improving uh, the pod and meeting our customer demands, but it's how do you make a smaller pod with a larger reservoir? But we have a lot of great folks in our innovation team at R&D that are working with those projects as we speak. Hmm. That's excellent. That's the, Now, how if you made um, a shift in, I don't know, let's say it was narrower but wider. I'm just making something up. How do you how do you seamlessly transfer from what making one to the other in your act and plan? You have to retool. And I mean, what kind of a, what kind of a process in your mind would that be? There'll be some retooling, obviously. Uh, but we knew that we had to be flexible. We would become less flexible with automation and robotics, obviously than our China facilities, which are much more manual. Uh, but we knew that we would need the flexibility for change. Uh, you know, we also run the the pod for Amgen's New Leicester, which is a different pod, mm -hmm. requires a changeover. So there is some flexibility in the automation and robotics. When you're up close, uh, you will see that some are just basically rubber arms that can be transferred out. Uh, so. Yeah, that's interesting. We'll, we'll be able to change uh, for the innovation. It should never stop if we slow down our innovation. That's excellent. What, um, how how many pods can you get through there in a day? <laughs> we don't share exact numbers, but uh, I don't think that's public. Okay. But uh, very, very high speed that folks didn't think was imaginable. Was, you know, it, it is a amazing a device so complex with so many components the speeds that we are running today mm -hmm. i have to say okay all right that's fair enough um it's is it making more today than it did the when i was there absolutely I see. yes i mean highly automated lines uh highly technical requires some ramp up time if we've uh, been saying and showing folks the team's done a great job of ramping up and learnings we put our second line in, as you know. Eventually, we'll have our third line up and running by the second half of this year. And as you saw on the tour, we built capacity for a fourth line. Oh, yeah. Uh, so as we learn, we improve and build into the next line and then make the improvements on the current line. So, yes, we are running a lot more pods than we did a couple of years ago when you were here. That's that's really something. All right. I have a question that I don't know if you can answer or not. Um if you are making new products that are coming out sometime, are you, um, I'm assuming that they run through the same line as the one you have now. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yes, a good example, Dash will run in acting just like Eros and eventually OP5 and Amgen. Yes. Okay. So you run shifts. Eros pods run for a while and then Dash pods run and Omnipod 5 eventually will run through there as well. Absolutely. Very cool. Um, I don't know how to ask this. <laughs> do you st do you start producing Omnipod five pods before you have the okay from the FDA, or do you wait for the moment and then start making them and then create a back uh, a backlog of them and then make it go public? Like, what's the way to do that? It'll be our comfort zone based off our questions from the FDA is we may build a little bit ahead of time at risk, meaning there's very low risk based off the questions and the submission, uh -huh. uh, because we want to make sure that we have product available, that we're highly confident that the FDA will approve. And so we will have some product that will, the day it's approved, we're ready to ship to our potters. That's very cool. But that's the risk we take financially. And we, we do discuss that in our meeting is based off the FDA feedback and the comfort level. How are we uh, and how much do we want to produce ahead of time? But the minute it's approved that we're available for shipment. How um, this is maybe a really like geeky question, but does the algorithm, because the algorithm is going to live on the, the board, I'm right in Omnipod 5. Omnipod, right. Did that change the power that you have to like, are the batteries the same, I guess is the question. 
Well, that's a very good question. I mean, because the algorithm is different, regardless whether it's on the pod or the PDM, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we're taking much more data collection, much more metrics on the on the pod five. Yes, it does use more power. But again, we, the benefit of building act and also, especially in Massachusetts, building uh, our U.S. manufacturing is we are right here on site with our R&D team. So we work very, very closely with them. Knowing that it's more power, we're able to work with our battery suppliers too. And we've significantly improved the performance of our batteries also. Oh, no kidding. Yes. I have to admit the the setup there is kind of uncommon. It feels uncommon. Like you're in an office. I, I was there to speak. So I'm. you're in an office setting. Then you go to a, com a big room. You're speaking to somebody. And then you just walk down the hall and go through a couple of doors. Then suddenly you're in a manufacturing place. It's... It's kind of, there's something I thought while I was there, this is kind of great because everybody's in one spot if, and, and that does really um, bear out, I guess, like being all in one location is valuable for you. It's very, very beneficial. Uh, a lot of folks ask, you know, how can you build manufacturing in Massachusetts and be cost competitive, et cetera. Uh, but there's so many benefits of being on site with our R&D folks, our global engineering teams, uh, our global purchasing team, uh, you know, supplier engineering to work with our suppliers with real-time data, especially if we have component uh, concerns. So there's a lot of benefits of being on site right here. Folks can, you know, walk down the hall and work with the manufacturing folks for immediate problem solving. Wow. What's the, um, in your mind, what inside of the pod is the most delicate? Is the the is it the injection process or like what are you most amazed by that's happening inside of that little thing? I guess is my question. Well, I'll tell you, there's so many. Uh, I mean, when, when you, next time you come, we might have to go in the clean room so you get up close and personal. When you see the intricacy of the components, uh, you know, our chassis, I call it's the transmission. It makes the pod work. Uh, you know, the cannula forming, the geometry required, and we automated that to make sure that we can be as consistent with the, the curves and forming your nail heads, et cetera. It's, uh, probably the cannula forming uh, is probably the most fascinating uh, part of the process with inside the pod that uh, amazes me. Okay. All right. So you're, I'm going to ask a question. I've been dying. This is such a strange question, <laughs> but, but Chuck, the people listening are going to be thrilled That's that okay. I ask. Okay. Right. So when you, when you put the pot on, you start the process for insertion, there's this clicking that happens and it's not all. And then the, the insertion happens. The insertion doesn't always happen on the same number of clicks. Is that clicking tension building? Like what is that whole process? What's happening when I'm hearing the clicking? It's just the release of the cannula. So I don't know why there'd be multiple clicks. It's something I'll take back to my team, but it's just the, the release of the cannula so it's, into the skin. Okay, so yeah, it's not, it's not that the it's not that the cannula is moving. There's this, I always take it as a building of tension, but is, is that not right? Is the, is the needle always at the correct tension? Uh, very, I will say always at the specific tension levels that it's supposed to be, which is extremely tight tolerances. Okay. Yes. So when you push the button and it goes, and it just kind of goes click, 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 and then bang, and it goes, bangs the wrong word but it goes yeah, right sometimes like i watch my daughter like she counts them in her head one two three four like she's trying to ready herself but sometimes <laughs> sometimes it'll go like six and she'll be like "Ooh, six <laughs> 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 and and i just don't I, I i i guess i'm dying to understand what that is only because it is the so while i'm giving you feedback i not that i think you could change it but i think that that click being audible is um, if you could make one thing different about the pod, I bet you making that click audible would be what most people would vote for. 
Okay. I yeah. will definitely take that back to our team. Yeah. I have no idea if it's something you can impact yeah, I, or not. I but. don't know. Quite frankly, I will commit that we can do it. We can easily look at it. We have extremely tight tolerances for the, when the cannula discharge. Yeah. So we'll look at that. Super interesting. I just, I'm fascinated by it, the whole thing, actually. Um, are you involved at all with the, um, with the adhesive process or is that just a part in your mind? I mean, obviously it's because it's a component, it's a critical component, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it adheres to the skin of the potter. I'm involved in it just as I am with the batteries and the cannula. So yes, I'm involved. So is the dance with adhesive always strong enough to hold the pot on, not so strong that it causes skin irritation? Is that the... Is that kind Absolutely. of... Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And I've learned more about adhesives since I've been here than I ever thought I would know about adhesives, but that's exactly the science okay. behind it is obviously we can make it much stronger, but you know, you don't want to irritate the skin, you know? So what's the right balance for a three day wear waterproof uh, without irritating the skin. So we work very, very closely, as I said, with all our suppliers, but also with our adhesive suppliers. I'm always trying to prove that. Uh, and again, we learned a lot. We didn't only build manufacturing redundancy, but we built redundancy of all of our components also. Hmm. So that even when some of our component suppliers went down for COVID, we always had a backup. It's the same with our adhesive. And that's why I learned a lot about adhesive. I thought it would just be as simple as calling a 3M or someone and say, give us an adhesive for the pod. It isn't. Yeah. And it wasn't. But we, we do have a second supplier. Uh, and that is the science behind the adhesive, yes. That's really interesting. Um, any any surprises, like learning about the medical the, the medical uh, world? Did anything really shock you? Was it was it impactful meeting people that have diabetes? Like, is there something that sticks with you? Like, if if you were out of this for ten years, and I asked you, you know, what do you remember about this? What what do you think it is? It's, we have potters come and talk at our town hall meetings. We had them at the ribbon cutting. We had them at the groundbreaking. The potter stories, how this device has changed people's lives positively, helped them more simply manage diabetes. And I said, I got, I saw what my daughter's uh, best friend went through and her parents. I'll always remember the potter stories more than building an act in or surviving through COVID. Uh, with supply. I mean, they're all great things and the team deserves all the credit. Uh, but the Potter stories and, you know, folks laugh, you know, I'm a driver, driver, uh, results focused. But when I hear the Potters talk, I'm a big baby. I've got tears in my eyes and crying and that's what it's about. And, you know, the ribbon cutting when our Potter spoke, uh, I had to get up and talk afterwards and I couldn't. It, it's, that's what I will remember. Yeah. And as I said, the biggest compliment is not building a world-class manufacturing as we did in folks say. Um, it's the quality improvements we made and hearing folks say that they haven't had a failure in three and a half years of a pod failure. It's a big that's, deal. that's what it's about. That's yeah. what I'll remember. Yeah, I, I really, I think Shashi should get a ton of credit because I know you guys have people come in to talk to the employees all the time so that people who don't have a connection to type one diabetes can understand why the device is so important. Um, and I I've given that talk before, uh, at a national sales meeting. And I looked down at one point and I was like, I am making everyone cry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, and mean I was to... one of them in the audience. I, guarantee. Yes. <laughs> I thought, Oh, I didn't, I didn't mean to make everyone cry like that. <laughs> so, uh, it, but, but it is really great to, um, I mean, because honestly, somebody has a, you know, they have a certain skill, they're looking for a job, they're not necessarily out in the workforce saying to themselves, I want to impact the lives of people with diabetes, they they get a job. And it's, I think it's really important for them to understand what this thing does. It's not just a, it's not just a stapler, you know, it isn't. And I can say that with all sincerity, as I said, as I was retired, I commute, you know, three hours every weekend, just about, uh, you know, I live up here in an apartment by myself away from family. Uh, but it really is about positively changing people's lives, living with diabetes. And that's why I'm still here. And that's why we're all here. Yeah. 
I have a couple more questions for you, and then I'll, sure. I'll, I'll let you go. First of all, I want you to know I was a little nervous because you are giving me a run for my money with how deep my voice is. I'm I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna sound like a soprano in this episode of the of the podcast, but. I, I'm also excited to be talking to someone who doesn't hear any of my Philly accent and think it's strange. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because we're both from Philly. Yeah. There. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, if they'll, I, they'll hear both of us with our Philly accent. Yeah. Water. Where's the uh, yeah. uh, the emails about the word water that I get are just <laughs> unrelenting. I, I know I don't say it correctly, but I, I can't stop myself. <laughs> when I say it correctly, it seems wrong to me. So I'm stuck. Same here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I, if you can, I, I just want to ask you a, a question about Omnipod 5. Um, sure. Significant impact on people's lives, you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, you just look at all the pivotal data, the clinical data. I, that's, I can't wait for the launch of, a, you know, Omnipod 5. I I think it's significantly on um, takes it to a whole another level uh-huh. of improving people's lives, living with diabetes, managing their diabetes. I've seen the videos, as I said, from potters and caregivers. Uh, we share them with our suppliers to make sure they understand the importance of their role in making sure that we always, always have the best quality product, especially for this new launch. I think it's one of the most anticipated launches in the diabetes uh, med device industry in history. So I'm very, very excited uh, for Omnipod 5 to be launched quickly. I am too. I, I keep imagining people who have struggled for a long time and have never been able to really figure out how how to use their insulin in, in a real, you know, in a, in a well-timed way. And just the idea of that being lifted off them you know, somebody with an A1C in a, in a, in a high range that, that could possibly within months see something significantly better is, uh, is very exciting because I, what I do, I think helps people, but everything's still reach and scale. If I, if I can't, if you don't hear the podcast, you're not going to know. And so, and to put something on someone like this, that would remove that, uh, from their life is I'm, I'm, I'm very, very excited. So, uh, I'm very excited. I'm very excited for what we've been able to do in the 30 days of freedom, the Omnipod promise to be able to offer to as many folks that want it. Yeah. Is there's, there's no reason to wait. That's excellent. No, I've, I've been telling people for a couple of weeks to just, just get it and if something new comes out, you can get that too. So yeah, that's really. <laughs> why would you get this new? Because it's the best platform out there. It will be the best quality. I'll continue to focus on that. I just can't wait. Well, Chuck, I'd like to get one of those pods signed by you one day. I'm gonna I'd hang <laughs> it up on my wall. Uh, I I really appreciate you doing this, taking the time. I I genuinely mean this when I tell you that since the day I left there, I thought about talking to you. So it's not a it's don't worry, it doesn't come into my head every day, but I, <laughs> I have it up on a on a, a wish list um, that's hanging in my office, and I'm gonna. I'm going to scratch your name off of it right now. I really appreciate you doing this. Well, no, I'm honored, and I thank you. Is You're welcome back for a tour anytime. It's changed significantly since we were here a couple of years ago. As I said, we put the second line in, the third being installed, ready for you know validation second half of the year. Yeah, uh, We're proud of it, but this is really a team effort. It's, it's not just me. Uh, we have a great, great team here that's really focused on our mission. No, I, I agree with you. I think that the people who have who came in and 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 were part of that restart and that they're building on top of with it just gets uh, more and more exciting as it goes along. So yeah, I, they talked me out of retirement. So it's a great team. <laughs> or <laughs> great product. So, I, I have yeah. to tell you, I, I think that that means a lot. I, I would imagine that people who are closer to retirement understand what you mean, maybe a little more than younger people. But that has to be a big leap to just. It's it's not like you were sitting at home wondering how to pay your bills, right? Like you were done. No, with a pension of benefits, and that's not it at all. It's yeah. As I told folks at the national sales meeting you, you referred to earlier, is there's not many times folks in their career can really make a difference in people's lives. I mean, at Pepsi, it was fun, and I got to see the world. I've toured, you know, dozens and dozens of countries, et cetera, visit. Uh, it's fun, right? but you are really impacting people's lives and it makes it a lot easier to wake up and come to work every day. 
Yeah, I agree. I don't think I am touching as many people as you do with that, but um, I am. I feel very lucky to do a thing that uh, I enjoy that also helps people. I didn't even think I would get that in my life ever, actually. So it's, it's just a great feeling. Yeah, it, it really, really is. is. Well, yeah. all right. So, Chuck, I'm gonna next time I meet you in person. I'm I'm assuming now that I'm thinking about this Pepsi thing, you've seen more than your share of Super Bowls in person. <laughs> I always had tickets, but I never visit. I always gave them to my team. I, I enjoyed having my own little Super Bowl party at home. I, I, I never went to You them. never went? Oh, no kidding. Well, But we always had tickets, and I, I just would pass them on. What, are you trying to seem like a great guy as this thing's over, Chuck? People already liked you. You didn't have to say that. that was... <laughs> <laughs> well, I did it for my own reasons also. Not just because <laughs> I, I enjoyed my – plus the Super Bowl – was a lot of work for the Pepsi folks, you know, yeah. all our customers there. So it wasn't the Super Bowl party that people think it's, it was a lot of work also. So yes, it was yeah. easier to do the uh, Super Bowl party. I hear you. I hear you. All right. Well, I, I really appreciate you uh, doing this again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Take care. You too. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors. Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. Thanks so much to Chuck for coming on the show. I'm super excited about what's coming from Omnipod. I hope you are too. I really want to thank him because I don't think this is the kind of thing he does usually. Can you imagine having a voice so deep that a microphone can't properly capture it? Chuck and Sam Elliott. And Sam Elliott is a distant second. Real quick, if you don't get the Sam Elliott references, you really need to go watch The Big Lebowski. I'll be back soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast.